All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Uh, we'll start off uh, worship service with a time of prayer to prepare our hearts for worship. Dear God, we thank you. We worship you because of who you are. And um, as we come together um, uh, virtually, God, with uh, hearts overwhelmed with blessing, I pray, God, that you uh, help us to be thankful for the things that we have, God, that what you have blessed us with, as well as uh, the ultimate blessing, the gift of Jesus Christ, God, that we can have hope at life. Um, we pray that at this time you are glorified, that... Um, our hearts are focused on you uh, as we give you the praise and worship and the glory that you uh, always deserve. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Yes. 
pray together. God, you are so great. God, especially in times of despair and times of darkness, it might be hard to see, but God, thank you for showing us your glory in in glimpses here and there and each and every sunset and in the cool breeze and and on warm days. Uh, In various ways that you reach out to us, God, thank you for showing us that you are, in fact, in charge, uh, the creator of the universe, uh, and in control in each and every moment of our lives. God, we come to you again this morning to worship you, uh, to lift up your name. And God, we know that, I know that sometimes it feels isolating to do so by myself uh, in an apartment where we don't feel as together. We don't know whether you are really listening, but that, God, thank you for your word and that we can trust your word and the promises that you give us, uh, that you are glorified and that you're lifted up in our worship, in our songs, in our prayer, in our offerings, uh, in the study of your word. So God, even at this time, uh, we pray that your name is lifted up and that you are pleased with this time of worship. God, as we move into the time of scripture reading and uh, learning more about you as we continue through Romans, be with Pastor Sue as he helps us contextualize and understand the way we are to interact with the law. Uh, God, I know that you have a message for each and every one of us exactly where we are. So God, meet us where we are, uh, that we might be able to move forward and more deeper in in a deeper knowledge of you, uh, and ultimately a deeper relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. Again, we pray that uh, you are lifted up by the position of our hearts during this time of worship. We thank you, and we pray all these things in your name. Amen.
passage today comes from Romans 7, 1 through 6. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in the members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Hello, everyone. Uh, good to see you guys. I'm glad that you guys are able to join us in a time of worship. Um, thank you, Junior, for again leading us in a time of praise and singing songs to our God. Uh, thank you, Shin, Deacon Shin, for uh, leading us in a time of prayer. Uh, and thank you, Mary Beth, for reading uh, scripture reading for us. And I just want to say a special shout out to. Um, there a group of a couple of young ladies that have been helping uh, with the worship service for quite some some time now. Um, they're I'm not sure if they're okay with me saying their names, but I'll say it anyways. Uh, their names are Huaran, Huaran Kim, and Sophia Kim. Um, of course, under the leadership of uh, Pastor Chris Bay, uh, they've been training and learning how to do all the video and audio uh, for our worship services, and so I just I'm. As a youth pastor, and I'm so uh, proud of these two uh, young ladies, and um, just just really can't say uh, can't say too much of, uh, about their commitment and their dedication so far. Um, but yeah, um, thank you, Pastor Chris, for uh, leading us um, in. Um, I don't want to say like a break from Romans, but um, as we know so far, Romans is a very deep and rich uh, book uh, written by written by Apostle Paul and um, we guys got a good um, uh, time in the word from Pastor Chris but as we go back into uh, Romans um, as I mentioned before uh, Romans chapter 6 7 8 uh, pretty pretty deep and dense uh, at times but uh, I pray that the Lord will uh, use me uh, to speak clearly and uh, exactly what the Lord wants me to say through uh, Romans, especially right now in Romans chapter 7. Uh, as Mary Beth read to us in Scripture, our work today comes from Romans chapter 7, 1 through 6. And if I can just quickly open us in a time of prayer, and we'll get right into it. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we give thanks to you. Thanks to you, God. Um, Lord, you blessed us so much, and you blessed us with your Son, Jesus Christ. You sent your Son to die on that cross, where we deserve to die on. But Lord, you've shown us grace and mercy. Lord, on that cross, you've shown justice and love at the same time. And Lord, we give thanks to you, because there was no way, there was no uh, possible way for us to to earn our salvation or to or to say that we are righteous on our own but lord jesus it's because of your righteousness that we can come before the throne of grace that we can stand because you lord jesus are standing in for us you're mediating between us lord our depravity our wretchedness our sin cannot come before you lord holy god but Lord, because of Christ, we are able to humbly and yet also boldly thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Lord, give us, Lord, um, clear minds and hearts as we listen to your word this morning. Use me, Lord Father God, to speak your word and only your word faithfully. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 7, 1 through 6. Uh, before we embark on Romans 7, uh, let's just be quickly reminded about God's uh, purpose in giving the law so far. Um, well, it sounds like someone who obeys the law is someone who can do it in, uh, in theory. Um, but in reality, no human has ever succeeded in obeying the law uh, fully. Uh, therefore, it can never be the way of salvation. Instead, the law reveals sin. It reveals, uh, if you, it reveals sin, it condemns the sinner, and it brings wrath. And sinners are justified by God, not through obeying the law, but through faith in Christ. And so far, almost all of Paul's mention of the law have been negative. Why? The law reveals sin, not salvation. It brings wrath, not grace. In today's passage, there are similar statements such as die to the law and released from the law. So is Paul saying that there is no more use for the law? Or are we to just crinkle it up like a piece of paper and do a fadeaway into the trash can? But whenever we come across a negative statement, in this case, the law, we need to find out what it is being contrasted to. For example, if you were to say to me, you're not beautiful, and stop there. Um, you could either be insulting me or flattering me, depending on how much you like me, I suppose. Um, but I wouldn't know until you said, you're not beautiful, but. And if you were insulting me, you'd probably be like saying, you're not beautiful, but you're, I don't know, ugly. I uh, hope you don't say that. Um, or if you were um, flattering me or saying good things to me, you'd be saying, you're not beautiful, but amazing. Um, in Romans 6, 14, Paul wrote that you are not under law, but under grace. We see a negative and we see a positive. And here, the contrast between law and grace shows that Paul is talking about justification. Remember, we talked about that in the previous chapters. Just a quick reminder, justification is God's declaring those who receive Christ to be righteous based on Christ's righteousness being imputed or made credited to the accounts of those who receive Christ. Which is not by our obedience to the law, but by God's mercy and grace alone. Now there can be three different attitudes towards the law, I think. One is your relationship to God depends on your obedience to the law. Or you completely reject the law and its demands. Or you rejoice in your freedom from the law and also the freedom to obey it. In today's passage, we'll see Paul address the first attitude towards the law. And Paul begins in chapter 7 by directing his readers as brothers, which means brothers and sisters, and asks again, do you not know? In chapter 6, he questioned their understanding of the meaning of baptism and what slavery entails. He now asks if they know the limited authority of the law. And we'll see why he says that. Turn with me to verse 1. It reads, or Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Now Paul lays down the principle which he assumes the Roman Christians know, and that is this. The law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. In other words, the law 
has an empire-like authority over a person, but this authority over a person is limited. The one thing that voids or cancels the authority is death. Death brings release from all obligations from the dead person. Law is for life, but death cancels it. Now turn with me to verses 2-3. to three. Let's read that together. It says this, For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Paul here uses the law on marriage to illustrate the point that a contract binding two people in relationship will no longer stand if the other person dies. Death changes not only the obligations of the dead person, but also the obligations of those survivors who had some kind of a contract or relationship with the dead person. And for example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from her marriage vows or from the law that binds her to him. And the contrast is this. The law binds her, but her husband's death frees her. Um, so then Paul comes to a conclusion. If the married woman lives with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies and she remarries, she is not an adulteress. So the question is, what, what's the difference? What makes the difference? How is it that one would make her an adulteress while the other does not? Well, Paul says here the answer is in her husband's death. The second scenario is legit because death has terminated the first marriage, which would give the right to remarry. Now turn with me to verse 4 and read with me. Verse 4 says, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Here, Paul now turns from human laws to the law of God. Now, Paul is implying that we were previously married to the law, and so under its authority. We used to relate to God by the law that he had set up to bind us to himself, but our disobedience meant that we faced death. Now, we have died with Christ. We have died with Christ so that the law can no longer condemn us to death. And as death terminates a marriage contract and allows for remarriage, so we also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that we may belong to another. But how did this death happen again? As we read, it happened through the body of Christ. And as Paul mentioned in chapter 6 in the previous chapter, through our union with Christ, we have shared in his death, and we have also died ourselves. So what does the death now have to do with the law? Well, die to the law is similar to die to sin. Die to sin would mean facing the penalty of sin. And what is the penalty of sin? Death. But as we die to sin, we also die to the law. And as we die to sin by union with Christ's death, we die to the law through the body of Christ. That's what Paul is saying 
through the body of Christ. As we have been justified and freed from sin, we have also been released from the law. Now we belong to Christ now and bear fruit for God. There are two purposes of our dying with Christ to the law. There is first an immediate purpose. The immediate purpose is that we may belong to Christ. Now then the ultimate purpose is that we may bear fruit for God. There have been dis uh, some disagreements on what fruit specifically means here by people far more knowledgeable than me. But it is agreed that the result of being released from the law and joined to Christ is holy living. For becoming a Christian involves radical change of allegiance. At the end of chapter 6, if you remember, our two slaveries were contrasted, right? Slavery to sin or slavery to Christ. At the beginning of chapter 7, it is our two marriages that are contrasted. Both speak of our new freedom to serve now, which is what Paul speaks, of, speaks on next. If you can turn with me to verses 5 through 6 and read with me. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law we're at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Paul points out that on our old life, living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now, having died to that which held us captive, that is the law, we are released from the law. We are free to serve as slaves of Christ. And our slavery to Christ is in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What Paul is trying to distinguish is between the old covenant, which was an external code written on stone tablets, and the new covenant in which the Holy Spirit writes God's law in our hearts. Paul is also showing us our old and new lives as well. In our old life, we were dominated by the flesh, law, sin, death. But in our new life, having been released from the law, we are slaves of Christ through the power of of the Holy Spirit. We were in the flesh, but are now in the Spirit. We were held by the law, but are now released from it. We bore fruit for death, but now we bear fruit for God. And what causes all this? Christ. Through the death and resurrection of Christ. We die to the law, through the death of Christ. Now we belong to Christ, having been raised from the dead with Christ. So the lingual question that still remains is, is the law still binding on Christians and are Christians expected to obey it still? Well, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that Christian freedom is freedom to serve, not freedom to sin. We have to remember that we are still slaves, slaves of Christ and righteousness. But also no, because the motives and means of our service have completely changed. Why do we serve? Not because obedience leads to salvation, but because salvation leads to obedience. How do we serve? We don't serve in the old way of the written code now. We serve in the new way of the Spirit. 
So is there any use of the law? Like, I get that, but is there any use of it? Um, we all have mirrors, I believe most of us do. And what do mirrors do for us? Uh, it shows us where our blemishes are, or uh, where a pimple is. Or for me, when I look at the mirror, I see that I've uh, gained some extra pounds, and it motivates me to go hit the gym. But what does it do? It helps us to see ourselves physically. But there are no material, physical mirrors for our soul. Such a mirror is found in the law of God. And when I look at that mirror, it never lies. It reveals my corruption. It reveals my complete inability. And it drives me to Christ. The law also serves as a restraint upon our sin. Laws are constantly being made. New laws are introduced or made by the government. And we also have law enforcement to keep a civil society. Like, have you ever imagined what our society would be like if we did not have any law? For example, we have laws that post the speed limits, right? We have speed limit laws at 65, but you know, what do we usually do? We don't go 65, right? We go like 75, 80 or more. If speed limits were removed, we would probably drive around, I don't know, 90, 100, maybe even, maybe even faster. What I'm trying to say is that as sinful as we are, we would be even more sinful if the restraints were completely removed. Freedom from the law entails freedom from its condemnation, not freedom from any obligation to keep God's commandments. For our justification, we are not under the law, but under grace. And for our sanctification, becoming more like Christ, we serve not in the old way of the written code, but in the new way of the Spirit. Remember, we are still slaves, but the one we serve is Christ, not the law. And the power by which we serve is the Spirit, not the written code. The Christian life is serving the risen Christ and the power of the Spirit. So what does it mean for us in our daily lives today? Well, despite being saved by grace, we still need to fight against sin. And once again, in this passage, Paul presents the great news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And through God's grace, we may be set free from the tyranny of sin in order to serve Christ instead. In living with God as our master, we have an obvious obligation to serve him. So although we know that we still sin, we are to offer the whole of ourselves, our minds, our bodies, our gifts in the service of God, and doing so continuously and much as we are able. And we do so not because it will earn God's favor, but in response to God's goodness in releasing us from the mastery of sin. A couple questions to ask yourselves. How much do you put your gifts and talents for God to use? To what extent do you put your plans and your time at God's disposal? Take a look at your life right now and see what area or areas radical change is perhaps needed. And be honest with yourself. Get uncomfortable. Get uncomfortable in the light of truth of God's word and pursue change in your life. And seek the Lord's help in doing so. 
because it is when we get too comfortable that we tend to lose sight on what is most important and pleasing to God. This passage has much to teach us about freedom. The world also teaches us freedom. And the world tells us that freedom means being able to do what you want to do and pleasing yourself however ways you can. But Paul says that this is impossible since all who are not in Christ are in fact slaves to sin, law, and death. So you're not actually free to do what you want and please as the world tries to make you believe so. You just think that you are. Furthermore, we are not released from sin, the law, and death in order to be our own master, but in order to serve the God who has saved us. And this service is true freedom, producing holiness and guaranteeing eternal life. Now to sin willfully and unrepentantly shows that we are not saved. To suggest that it no longer matters if we sin because God will forgive us anyway is to show that our allegiance is to rebellion. We show that really, we really just want to serve ourselves. Such an attitude shows our ignorance of the results of willful, unrepentant sin. And if we continue to sin in this deliberate manner, we will deserve the ways that we are paid, and that is death. This passage should teach us that God does not in any way take sinning lightly. We should be cautious of the temptation ever to think that it doesn't matter. It matters. It matters tremendously. And it matters tremendously because it matters to God. If you are in sin, you must bring it out into the light. Sin wants to stay in the dark and it lies to you that it must stay in the dark or you'll be embarrassed, you'll be ridiculed, you'll be ostracized, you'll be belittled, you name it. It's like a roach that scurries into hiding once you turn on the light. It does not want to get exposed. It wants to survive. But we must expose our sin and pursue in killing it or it will kill us. We have been set free from the law by Jesus' death. If Christ had not died, we would still be bound to the law and therefore to death. Having died with Christ, we are free to serve Christ. Having died to the law, we should be careful to slipping back into legalism, thinking we have to do good or religious things in order to earn God's favor, which according to Paul, Again, it is impossible. Again, it is only God's work through Christ that saves us. A fact that we should hold on to with increasing gratitude. At this time, we'll take the time of uh, personal reflection on what you have just heard this morning from God's Word. And if there's anything to confess, there's anything to repent of. There's anything that the Lord, through His Word to you, has placed on your heart. Don't let it just slip away. Don't, let, don't just ignore that. At this time, about a minute, to take some time to pray to the Lord and what He has placed on your heart. Confession, whether that's thankfulness, whether that's requests, whatever it may be, you know. If you could take some time to do that right now.
thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for watching over us this week, guiding us, leading us, whispering to us, speaking to us, through your word in times of prayer. And Lord, please forgive us as um, we have not done that consistently. But we look at other things in our lives and we pour our energy and time into the things that we, we do. Lord, there are certain things that we definitely have to do. But Lord, we tend to make excuses to put you on the side. Forgive us and help us, Lord, so that, Lord, you are the center of our lives. Lord, help us to grow you know, not only of our knowledge of you, but through as I grow in our knowledge of you, God, that we will grow in our relationship with you. And our hearts will just thirst, pant for you, God. yearn for you, God, more and more. God, I, we, we don't want to do that naturally because of our simple nature. Lord, you have saved us. You have changed us. May we live changed lives. It's faithful to you, Lord. Father God, please uh, bless our church as we are praying and searching for next EM pastor. And I pray that we will continue to pray and expectantly pray so that you will send next EM pastor who loves you and loves for other people to love you. That is true to your word stands for the truth of your word. Father God, we, we pray, Lord Father God, for you to send our next year and pastor. And Lord Father God, we pray for each and every one of our lives that we are now free. But that doesn't mean that we are free to just do whatever we want. We are free to serve you. May we serve you joyfully, willingly. May we do it in thankfulness. Thank you, Father. We lift up everything to you. We lift up our offerings to you, God, as well. May it be used for your kingdom and glory, Lord. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. All right, at this time, we'll have a time of offering and song of reflection.
said, Savior, I surrender all to Jesus. I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. May thy Holy Spirit. you uh, even through the giving God of what you have already given us uh, to help us to come to know you and to desire you more God that you are glorified by the actions of uh, your people uh, among so many other ways that uh, people can come to see you God I pray that this offering is used to further your kingdom God that people will come to know you um, the, the people you have placed within and this church's reach God I pray that we reach um, and those that are serving you, God, full time on the staff, I pray that this offering goes to provide for them and their families as they continue to serve you, God. We worship you, God. Please be glorified in this place and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Uh, it's a good Sunday. It's especially a good Sunday this Sunday because we get an extra hour of sunlight in a part of the day that really matters. Uh, so I hope you get to enjoy these long days in this beautiful North Carolina spring. Again, my name is Shin, and I have a special announcement uh, for you guys this morning. Um, as you know, uh, our pastor Sue, our current interim pastor, has been uh, nominated for ordination, and there's a vote coming up for in regards to his nomination in two weeks. Uh, so before that nomination takes place, I want to formally introduce him and, and give you all some of details about who this guy really is. Now, you have some slides in front of you, and there are going to be some important details, but there are some more important details that I need to tell you about before we get there. Um, although he worked for Chick-fil-A, and that was, there's a lot of fun stories there, so you should ask him about those stories. His favorite food is kimchi jjigae. Favorite drink, Dr. Pepper. He's a football fan. Uh, he's a big fan of the Baltimore Ravens. And believe it or not, uh, you couldn't tell by how gentle he is and how soft-spoken he is, but, but he was a football player in high school. He played for the highly coveted positions of wide receiver and cornerback. And although he might say that he rode the pine as a bench warmer, I don't believe it. I don't think he was a bench warmer, but you'll have to ask him about that. Um, and finally, he's a bit of a fashionista. Uh, and it's, I asked him what his favorite shoe was, because I know he, he likes shoes. And upon, I kind of distracted him for a while, and he said his favorite shoe is the 1996 Jordan 11s, when Jordan came back out of his fake retirement, in the color scheme of the Space Jam colorway. I don't agree with the Space Jam colorway, but I think that's a great pick for shoe. Okay, enough of the juicy details. We need to get into the more important details, I guess. He's married to Unzu Kim. Um, he immigrated to Baltimore at age two. Uh, his important transition in life um, started at age 16. You might have heard his testimony a few months back uh, at the persistent invitation of his mother's friend, went to church, and finally at age 20, uh, confessed Christ as his Savior and Lord and baptized at age 20. Uh, his pastoral calling happened shortly thereafter as a youth um, volunteer in his early 20s. Uh, and then decided to, he was called into full-time ministry uh, and confirmed his calling at the age of 25. On the next slide, you're going to see some information about his education. Of particular importance is uh, that he began his Master's in Divinity at Southeastern Baptist in 2017 and will be graduating in May of this year. Again, you will also see some details regarding his ministry experience. Again, of most importance is that he's been at our church, FKBC, since 2018 and is currently serving um, 
<clears throat> as the interim EM pastor as well. His life verse comes from 1 Corinthians. It says, so whatever, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Amen. Um, yeah, so please be in prayer for Pastor Sue as he continues to serve as our interim and also as the vote for his ordination comes up in the next two weeks. Um, so that's all I have for you. I'm going to ask Ben to come up for the following announcements. Thanks for joining us online today. We're so glad we are with us. We will continue to hold our 11 a.m. worship online each Sunday until further notice. Uh, only essential staff and volunteers will be in the church building, and we ask that you join us online for worship. All other in-person church meetings are suspended. If you're newer to our church, and especially if you started joining us after we moved everything online, welcome. We're so glad you're with us today. If you'd like to learn more about our church, please email our newcomers ministry, and we'd love to answer your questions. If you'd like to join our church as a member, we invite you to take our upcoming two-part new member class. Our next classes will be on March 21st and 28th, right after service. Please email us to let us know that you're interested in the class, and we'll send you a link to the Zoom meeting. We will have a church business meeting online on Sunday, March 28th, to discuss the church's 2020 finance report and approval of Pastor Sue's ordination. All church members are asked to attend virtually. If you are participating in our church's scripture writing project, please make sure that you bring your completed writing to the church foyer by April 3rd. You should clip your pages together with the provided paper clips and place them in the bin in the foyer. As we look for a new English ministry pastor for our church, we want this whole process to be covered in prayer. So if you've started a prayer chain, please sign up for a time slot to commit to pray for our church in the pastor search process. Also, the pastor search committee wants to learn what we, our church congregation, think is important in a new pastor. Please help them by filling out the survey at the URL on your screen. We really miss seeing everyone and we want to see how you're doing. Submit a selfie and a family photo for your small group leader for our While You Were Quarantining EM photo project. Please include your name, children's ages, and a caption for your photo. Even though we're not meeting in our church building, we still need resources to minister to our community. You can give your tithes and offerings online at the URL on your screen and give to specific funds we have like Cambodia Missions. You can also drop off or mail in a check to the church building. The church address can be found on our website. All of these announcements can also be found online. You can always check our church website and our Facebook page for the most up-to-date information. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week.